welcome to section. Uh, today is just going to be all quiz review for your quiz on Wednesday. I hope everyone remembers that they had a quiz on Wednesday. And if you didn't, well, now you've been reminded. So Wednesday, make sure to show up for class or other accommodations as necessary. Um, you guys are going to be awesome. It's going to be great. And I'm going to do everything I can to help prepare you today uh, for your quiz now. And also, in case you don't know, there is a course-wide review session today at 7 o'clock in Northwest Labs, rooms B, B103. You can see me again for an encore as I will lead part of that review session also. So if you can't get enough of me now, you can come again tonight. All right, so first things first, just some quiz tips um, before we actually dive into review. So as with any exam, practice will definitely help you out. There are exams from the past six or seven years on there. So that's a lot of practice material for you guys to have. Um, and in fact, today is really just going to be going over any topics that you guys have questions on, as well as working through practice problems from quiz zero. So I'll throw up quiz zero from last year on here, and we can work through any problems that you guys would like to. So practicing. You're going to start doing that today. Code on paper. So yeah, if everyone could like actually get out paper, um, that'll be great because you're not going to have your computer on the exam and writing out code um, by hand is often much more difficult than you might expect. Um, you're used to just like seeing it and typing it and you have your compiler to help you out when you have errors, but you don't get that <laughs> on the exam. So it's really important to actually be able to write out the code and that muscle memory of doing it by hand will really help you. So. We're getting a little close. It's Monday. Your exam's on Wednesday. But if you have time, definitely take one of the exams from last year or the year before under the time constraint of an hour and a half. Just knock out an hour and a half of time and put, sit yourself down and just work through the problems as if you were actually taking it. Because one of the biggest things that we hear about the quizzes is that they are very long. Um, it is a lot of material. There are a lot of questions. and. Most people may not finish. I, don't, I know that I totally did not finish my quizzes when I took the class. On that note, as a less comfortable section, understand that this course is meant to cater for people of all levels. The whole reason we have you split less comfortable somewhere in between and more comfortable is to kind of uh, make it more fair. And if you are less comfortable, it's not necessary per se to get everything. Like if you were getting everything, you would probably be in the more comfortable section. So obviously don't beat yourselves up too hard if you can't finish the exam. Like take it from me, I didn't do it. I'm still a concentrator. I'm still helping teach the course. You'll be fine. All right, and lastly, get some sleep. Obvious, with any exam, we always say this, cramming the night before and not getting any sleep does not, maybe if that works for you, go for it. But for the vast majority of people, getting some sleep Letting your brain you know, rest and recover before coming in for the exam will really help you. Also, there will almost surely be candy at the exam, so you have that to look forward to. You guys are going to do great. It's going to be fine. So and now in the next hour and a half, I will try and prep you as best as I can. So I have slides from basically all sections up to now. I'm not going to go through all of them because that will not uh, <laughs> That is not feasible in an hour and a half, as well as working through practice problems. So instead, I have a list of topics. These are all the things that we could like quiz you on. Um, if there's anything that really jumps out that you want to go over, uh, that you want me to go over conceptually, I can try and give you an overview there. Or if you want to jump right into doing practice problems together, we can do that. It's up to you guys. There aren't that many of you. So it's whatever you guys like to do. I want to be the most helpful toward you guys. So I'll let you just look. Um, one thing is the chart that we keep seeing about the stack mm -hmm. and the heap. Just the whole idea behind that and what that means. Yeah, OK. Let me, this is all the way at the end, so let me scroll through. We don't have to do it now, but whenever. Is, was there anything else? Your uh, this one. <clears throat> this is kind of fuzzy for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I second that. And can we also do buffer overflow? Buffer, buffer overflow. Tomorrow? Okay. So uh, buffer overflow is pretty easy just to kind of talk about. It's basically um, buffers. You can think about like some array of memory that you have, right? Um, we typically talk about buffer overflow when you're not checking 
how much the user is putting in, right? And the idea being with buffer overflow is they are putting in far too much data for the space that you have allotted for them, right? So if you say, uh, give me some message, right? We're assuming that they're going to give us a reasonable length message, you know, maybe a couple lines, whatnot. So we don't check. Instead, they feed us in an entire book. That's a message. And it overflows the amount of space that we've allocated for this. And what happens is it might overwrite places that it's not supposed to. So I know uh, Professor Malin said something about buffer overflow attacks, right? So that's where the user will input some massive amount of data in the hopes that he overwrites to past the end of your buffer and replaces something. Um, I wonder if we have those slides in here. I don't think we have those slides in here. Um, but basically, he overwrites some portion of memory that allows him access to parts of your computer that you wouldn't normally have access to. Um, biggest thing with buffer overflow is just to understand that it happens when you aren't checking how much your user is putting in, when you aren't um, kind of safeguarding against that. And it's at its simplest thing, you were, it's just your user inputting a massive amount of data in an attempt to overwrite some security portion of your memory. That's all it is. So this here, stack and heap, basically all it is is just a representation of memory um, and where things are stored. That's really kind of all you need to know. The biggest things that you need to know are that, let me see if there's a better here. So like this is um, <clears throat> the stack here. So stack has to do with all of like your functions that you're calling at any given time. And what's important to remember going off of last week with malloc is that you don't really have necessary control over it. Like it all depends on like when certain functions are executing. And when they are executing, they have what are called stack frames that go up here. So it all it kind of happens without any real input from you, right? Like you write your program and you let it run, and the stack kind of takes care of itself as it needs to. So if in main you're calling cube, that will be passed up here. It'll create a frame. But there's nothing you explicitly do to create that stack frame other than write the function to begin with. Okay? What is kind of under your control is the heap with malloc. So whenever you malloc something, you are putting, you are taking memory from the heap. And that is memory that you have, for lack of a better word, explicit control of, control over. Because remember, with malloc, it's basically there until you say otherwise. For those of you who watched section last week, it's there until you tell it to go away. Like, it will be there unless otherwise told not to. So the heap is just something you can think of as um, memory that you have control over. And those are just the two different, those are the two big things. Other than that, you shouldn't have to worry too much about stack and heap. Um, Questions are typically more just like if you have local parameters or like a function, like would it be on the stack or the heap? And obviously in this case it'd be the stack. If you're mallocing something, where is that coming from? The heap. Those are generally, if you look at practice quizzes, those are generally the type of questions that they have. You don't have to worry too much about it. You get into more explicitly about stack and heap later on or in other CS classes. So just having kind of a general idea of what this is would be good. which. I just kind of went over. Any other topics? Yes. Do you remember pointers again? Pointers? Um, would you, do you want like conceptual overview of pointers or do you want like practice with pointers? Kind of, yeah, kind of like the syntax. I was the syntax? Yeah. Come on in. Okay, we're getting there. Yeah, so this is just kind of something when you have a recursive function, um, every time that recursive function is called, it just adds another stack frame. It's pretty much an example of how you don't really have control over the frames on your stack. Okay, pointers. Uh, okay, all right. So creating pointers, remember it's just type star. So whatever type of data that you're going to be pointing to, so this would be a pointer to an int. 
This would be a pointer to HR. This would be a pointer to a float. So it's basically whatever you want it to be pointing to, star, is how you declare the pointer, OK? But then, obviously, it gets a little tricky when you have like pointer or you have star or whatever. So the big difference is when you're declaring, right? So we have some. So this takes some int star. So this is some pointer called x to an int, right? So remember what this does is this calls, this is some x, and this is going to have some address, right? So let's just say this is, this is our address, right? Pointers hold addresses. So what this says is that at some, at this location, we are storing an int. So another way we can think of this is that this is some int. We haven't really assigned it to anything yet, but it's just an int. So what we can do is if we do star x equals 5, this becomes a 5. Okay. This says go to whatever x is pointing at. So go to this address and make it equal to 5. So we assign 5 to this address. right? And then if you do this, this gives us the address of. OK, this is the address of operator. So what is the address of x? We don't know. We haven't assigned it an address. It's some, we could say it's some, now we gave it an address. So the address is 4. And actually, if we go through something like this, kind of similar to what we did. So working through here, I find it helps if you draw out pointers. If you're on your exam, I highly recommend drawing boxes. So this first one, int x equals 5. This just means we have some place in memory that is 5, right? And our table here tells us that it's at address address 0x4 or 0x04, OK? And then we create some pointer. So let's break this down one at a time. So this creates some box to an int, right? It's going to hold some address of an int. So this is some pointer. And this chalk is really small. So we have some pointer here. Um, and our table tells us that its address is 0x08. Cool. And we are assigning it to the address of x. Remember, pointers hold addresses. Okay. So if we want to hold what is it x, we have to use the uh, address operator, which is the ampersand, to get the address of x, which in this case, 0x04. right? And then if we have some int, copy, this just creates some other box that holds an int called copy. And if we assign it to this, so this is referencing it. So it says go to whatever address pointer holds. Pointer holds this address. So we go over here and we say, OK, what's in it? Five. So copy becomes five. Makes sense. What if I did? What if I tried to assign this to this pointer? What does pointer actually equal? It would just be whatever pointer contains, right? And then what if I did this? What would copy be now? 4x08. Yep, the address of our pointer. Is that any part of that that needs to be re explained? Cool. OK. There is definitely a very fun problem on quiz one that we can go over um, that gives you more practice. The guys from last week can tell you it wasn't that bad. We got through an entire chart and everyone did great. OK, so that's kind of. Overview of syntax of pointers.
biggest thing is understanding how to create them, um, dereferencing, and address of. Okay? Cool. Any other topics before we dive into practice? Also, if you come, if like we're going through the practice problems and there's like something you want to refresh on, we can do that too. Do you have something? Structs and linked lists. Structs and linked lists. Okay. So, structs. We actually are going over this tonight too. Okay. So, structs. Structs are basically just um, a way for you to hold multiple values of different types, right? So, with an array, we are constricted to one data type. Our array either has to just be numbers, or just be chars, or just be you know, floats. But maybe you need to contain more than that, right? Maybe you need to hold, you know, if you're talking about like a student, you're going to have their house, their ID number, their age, um, where they live, right? And all of those are different sorts of types. So you can't store those all in an array. So what you can do is you can create a struct, which you can think of as your own personal data type. So instead of just having ints and instead of just having floats, you can have a type student that has all of these fields in it. So the way we initialize our structs is, actually, you know what, here. Since my writing is terrible, we are going to transition to typing. Woo. Bam. OK, so if we want to create a struct, I'm just going to do it down here. Disregard the uh, int main, whatever, which we will use later. So the way you want to do it is with type def struct, right? Then let's just call this student because that's what I was using. Okay, so type def means you're defining a new type. Okay, you don't. There are nuances into like when you do just a struct versus a type def struct. For all intents and purposes, you guys are just going to assume they're approximately the same and just use type def struct for now. It'll become way more apparent in your next P set what those differences are, but I don't think you need to worry about that right now. I would much rather you know how to create one, access it, and assign it value. A new type of struct, and we are calling it student. So for after we're done creating, this, for all intents and purposes, you will have a type called student. And you can think of it just as a type, like an int, or a float, or a char. It is just another type, OK? So in this one, what do we have? We have maybe a name. So maybe we want a string name. And we have maybe an int that's an ID. And we have another int that's phone number. And we have some, uh, let's see, what else might we have? We'll have some string that is house, right? All things that a student has. So this creates a struct now. So how might we create like a student? If we have some variable that is going to talk about Walker here, right? So we have, we're just going to call this Walker. He needs a type. What's your type? Student. Student. So this just creates an object you can think of that has all these things. We just created a Walker student. So now we need to be able to assign all these, right? So does anyone remember how we access within a struct? Period. Period. Exactly. So if we wanted to assign him a name. Do that. Obviously, this would be like this part here would be within main. So actually, let me do this. Let's declare this above main so that we can use it within main. There. Okay. So. Now I want to do ID, and we'll just do some there, and then we'll assign a house. Bam. Cool. So now 
should we ever need to access anything um, later on, maybe we, hmm, if we ever need to access anything, let's just do a int copy ID. And I want to copy Walker's ID into this. How might I do it? You need to access within the Walker struct to his ID. In the same way that we assigned it up here, how might we access it when we want to just give that value to something else? Walker.id? Yeah, exactly. So that's pretty much all you need to know for structs. Um, you just need to think of them as another variable. Basically, a create your own variable type, okay? Um, and you use them, this, you use it to declare variables in any way. Um, here, walker is still a variable. He just has a type student now instead of a type int or a type string or a type char. It's strictly, if there was an easy way to talk about structs, it is literally just a create your own data type, okay? That allows you to group all these different, all these different like kind of data together. Does that make sense? Okay. That and accessing with dots. Pretty much all you need. Okay. Where did my PowerPoint go? Well, this is easy. Ah, okay, cool. Any other things or do we wanna head to practice? Practice? Okay. Awesome. So I'm gonna exit this. If at any point during practice questions, I am happy to revamp and go through things. Um, so I have quiz zero up here. If you guys want to pull it up on your computer, um, just like take five minutes to browse through. Maybe choose some top questions you want to go over. If you guys are really, you can't decide, we'll just slowly start working through them. But I'm sure there are going to be some questions that you are particularly eager to talk about and have me work through with you all. So just go ahead and take five minutes, scroll through. And this is um, the quiz from 2013. Yeah, quiz zero. We're not doing quiz one stuff. Mm -mm -mm. We'll do that in a couple weeks. Also, for those of you who came in late, we have candy, so. Do you guys want candy? <laughs> I'm just going to pass. Hey, if you guys get here early, you get more candy. That's fine. Shane, you want candy? Okay. Do you want some of these? <laughs> There's also Snickers. If anyone wants Snickers, I'll leave them here and here. Feel free. Do you want any more? Okay. I know you had a nice little pile there at the beginning. <clears throat> You guys get to take a quiz, and I get to have a quiz grading party. Woo. Just chaos. 900 exams. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be great. I'm pretty sure that's one of the biggest staff bonding nights of the year. Has anyone done Quiz Zero from last year yet, out of curiosity? Of it. No, parts of it. Okay. Did you have questions on any of them? Uh, I already went to office hours. Oh. So thank you, though. Oh <laughs> man. Okay. Well, hopefully, it's still kind of helpful. When were, when did you go to office hours for that? My TF had them this afternoon. Oh, who's your TF? Uh, Fred Rajaya. There are so many TFs. So many. Oh. 
Where we're at. Anyone have any to start that I can jot down that we want to work on? I assume the point is one with the table. Uh -huh. Maybe the switch one. The switch one? Okay. So number 12. I assume number 8 and 9 are probably ones people want to go over. And 10 and 11. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you guys know you get one page of notes, right? Yeah, so what are we allowed to put on that? You're allowed to put anything you want. And it can be typed, as far as I remember. Ours were typed. Both sides? Yeah, both sides. So something like the heap and back and heap, your running times, useful. Maybe like little things about pointers to remind you, syntax for things. Um, Having just like a skeleton program can be super useful. I know that I always forgot like exactly what I was supposed to write for int main um, because I always just copy paste from my previous pset or it's already there. So like I never really wrote it. Um, so having that can be super useful. Okay, so why don't we start with number eight then? All right, okay. So consider the program below. So obviously when we see pointers, probably a good idea to start drawing, right? I wanna know where all my big pieces of chalk went. It was kind of annoying. So we have here some swap function that's gonna take in two pointers. So in this case, they'll actually, they should actually be switching things. Um, versus our original swap function that only took in copies. So what it's going to do is, let's start with main, because that's where one is. So we have some int x. That's one. We have some y. That's equal to two. And then we have some swap that's going to take those. And let's see what we have here. Oh, actually. Okay, and in our table, oh boy, how am I going to do this? I'm going to draw my table over here. Barely making it there. Barely making it. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, and they give us that one is one, one is one, two. Cool. Awesome. Three, and that's what we want. All right, and then address of x is zero, one, two, three, and y is zero, one, two, three. Cool. All right, I want you guys to work on this for just like working on it with the people around you. I should have said that while I was setting up. But work on it, try and work on it by yourselves for a couple minutes, and then I will work on it with you. Because the only way you're really gonna learn is by doing it yourself.
No worries. Good luck. Okay, why don't we slowly start working through this. So, everyone gets after line one, x is one, after line two, x and y are one and two, right? Cool. So line three is where things get interesting, of course. So what we've done here is we have now swapped, we say that x and y have those points, um, or they have the address of x and of y, right? So in this case, that three, what is the value of A? A has been passed in, has been given the value of the address of X, right? One. So the address of X. What's, it, what's X's address? Zero X, one, two. Exactly. <coughs> But what is A actually like pointing to? If we were to dereference A, what value would it give us? One. It would give us one. Because what we're saying is go to this address, tell us what the value is. So what would B be? Um, 0x127. Exactly. So it's the address of Y. And then what dereference? Two. Oh, B. Okay, so now four. We said A is equal, well, now we've done int temp is equal to star of A. So what changes? There's only one thing that changes here. What is it? The temp. So we can rewrite all of these. A good strategy for these is just figuring out what changes, because most often, there's only one thing that's going to change at any given point, OK? So we've assigned temp. Now at our next point, 5, we have made star A equal to star B. So what changes now? Star A. So everything else stays the same. <coughs> and what does star A equal? 2. Two. Oh, please. Awesome. OK. And then now we have star B is equal to temp. So the only thing changing is star B. Everything else stays the same. And what is star B equal to now? Two. We completed the table. Right? Because now at the end, if we say x and y, we know that at this point, we know that when we changed star a right to 2, what that did is it said, OK, at address 0x123, here, change it. So now this was 2. And then at this point, we said, OK, go to star b. So go to the address at 0x127 and make it a 1. So now at the very end, when we actually return from main, we actually have that x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 1. Everyone good with that? OK, cool. Number 9. You guys work on this. I'm going to set up the board so we can draw through it. Be black. The big tables can be really scary, I know. But if you just take them one row at a time, they get a lot less scary.
All right. So we know that this will have gone through main first, right? Initializes x and y, then tries to swap them. So even though swap is above, the real way it goes is that we're going through main, and then it's calling up to swap, right? Just so everyone knows that. So which one do you guys want to start with? Is anyone like really sure about one of these? Or even partially sure? Why don't we start with x? What do we think x is? 1. 1. <clears throat> so then y is 2. Okay. And that's because the big distinction here is that we are only passing copies in, right? We're not passing by reference. So even at the end of this program, x and y have stayed the same because they are out of, they are just copies in the swap function. They don't actually change, right? So what about a, b, and 10? So a, b, so in this case, a was x, which is 1, right? So here, let's walk through it. So at the beginning, a and b are 1 and 2 and undefined, right? So originally, temp gets assigned to a. So temp is 1. a is equal to b. So we get 2, and b is equal to 10. So we get 1. Mm -hmm. In the previous one, it swapped like ampers and right. x and ampers and y. What exactly does that mean? So that means that you're passing by reference. So that means you're actually passing in the addresses of where x and y are stored. So you're not swapping the addresses. You're not swapping the addresses. Okay. You're swapping what's within them. OK. Um, like what's at that address, and that's why it works. Versus um, in this program here, what you're doing is you're creating copies. So you have x and y that exist as their own variables, like out here. But then when you pass them into swap, it's as if you're creating this whole other set. So you're never actually touching x and y. If ampersand x is what is at the address of x, mm -hmm. what would star x be? Ampersand x is at the what's at the address of x, then star, well, in this case, x is not a pointer. Oh, OK. Yeah. So you only do this because it's not right. a pointer. OK. You can only do star of something that's a pointer. Maybe you could do it if things that aren't, but if the compiler let you do that, crazy things would happen. And I'm not exactly sure what would happen. Um, you can always take the address of something, but you can't dereference something that's not a pointer. Does that make sense? That's a good distinction to have. <laughs> OK, so not too bad, right? The tables are hopefully getting slightly less scary. All right, ah, the fun ones. So now, writing your own code. So I'm going to let you guys work on this for about four minutes. And then we can talk about ways to approach it. Feel free to talk to people around you. Also, this is interesting. It's like an all-girl section right now. It's pretty exciting, except for Chang. But Chang's not really a part of section. So. Perfect. <clears throat> so I will give you a couple hints. Um, you're going to need to, in the case where you have more than one character, right, where you have something that's like 123 or 1,000 something, you need to be able to like loop through and convert each of those. Um, so there's a couple ways you could do that. But you're definitely going to have a for loop somewhere in there to loop through them, which is kind of like the giveaway with even if you call Sterling, which is kind of like, oh, maybe you want to use the length of this string in some way.
All right. So what do you guys think might be one of the first things we want to do? There's a couple cases in here we need to account for, right? Either we have something that's null. We have, we have null. We have the case that um, it has something other than 0 and 9, right? So let's say it has letters. Or we have the case it's valid. Right? Three cases to think of. So which one do you think might be the easiest one to take care of first? Null. The case is null. So what would we do there? And what do we want to do? Return to zero. Exactly. Awesome. OK. So now, case that it has letters and the case that it's valid. We can actually take care of this within one loop. OK. So one way to do it, what might be a simple way to check if it's valid? You would have to go through each letter, right, and do what? Check if it's in. Right, and check if it's between, between zero, zero and nine. nine. Yeah. Right? Um, and then in the case that it's valid, we're going to end up iterating through our string, anyways, right? Mm -hmm. So why don't we try and combine that into one? We're going to iterate through our string, and as we do that, we're going to first do a check to see if that you know, letter or if that character is valid. If it is, we're going to perform the operation that we need to convert it. Otherwise, we'll return zero, right? So before we do that, we probably want some variable that we can return at the end, right? That's going to be our actual value. So we're going to initialize some value to be 0. And that's just how we start. <clears throat> so I'm going to get rid of this. So how are we going to iterate through this string? For loop. A for loop. So what's in our for? And i is 0. Mm -hmm. And what are we and iterating until? Um, it's your length of s. OK. OK, now remember there's a better way, or sorry. Yeah, we can do n equals. Exactly. Length of s and i is less than n. Mm -hmm. And why would we want to do that? Remember the reasoning? Because recalculate this way you only have to calculate sterling once. If you do i is less than sterling s, that means it recalculates the length every time you run the for loop, which isn't a huge cost of energy, but it's better practice to try and do things like that once. Unless maybe you have a crazy string that's changing at every iteration. But if it's staying the same, save it. All right, and then i plus plus. Awesome. Okay, we are on our way. Awesome. Really quickly. For, so let's say we just did like I less than Sterling less. Are they grading us on design at all? Or just um, they are not. We are grading on correctness for quizzes, as far as I know. I cannot make like a full on guarantee, um, but for the most part, vast majority is correctness because you're under a lot of time constraint. Design typically means you have time to like think about the elegance of your situation. <clears throat> OK, so we're iterating through. So we need to either check to see if this character is valid or if we can perform like our normal a to i function, right? We can worry about what that is in a second. So why don't we take, if anyone can think about a way to check to see if this is valid. We know it's going to be some if condition, right? And remember, this is in ASCII. So how might we? See if it's not 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. Is alpha? Um, so if alpha would only let us know if it's a letter, and if they give us a symbol, it's still not quite going to check. So if you pull up your ASCII table, we know that 0 through 9 are in one segment, right? They're, tell me the numbers that they correspond to, if it's possible. Forty. Oh, no, I'm just so the range is like forty. I mean, 
48 to 57. I'm not 40 sure. to 57? 48, I think. 48 to 57. Okay. So yeah. we know that those yeah. ASCII symbols, if, they're, if the ASCII value is not between 48 and 57, it's not valid, right? So could we use that to our advantage, possibly? So we could do, how are we going to get this letter, first off? How are we accessing this letter, or this, this character? S bracket I. Mm-hmm. Because we can think of strings as arrays, remember? So what do we want to say? We want to say if this is what? Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's a less than. But what do you think it needs to be less than? Um, 57. 47, right? But we could also represent oh, that yeah. as, the, as zero in single quotes because that's the character zero. You could also put 47. Um, having the ASCII table, as you see, which is something you should have on your quiz. So, if this is the case, so if it's less than zero, not necessarily and, right? So it's only either going to be less than or greater than nine. Yeah. So, can you fill out this last part for me? So, or S of I is what, Maria? Oh, uh, greater than uh, nine. Nine. Okay. Does that make sense to everyone how we got there? These problems kind of, they're like, once you see the solutions, it's like, oh, okay. And this is why practice will help you. Okay, so we return zero. Lovely. All right. Otherwise, what do we want to do? This is the interesting part where it's a little more like math versus CS, in my opinion. Does anyone have an idea of how we might do this? So the important thing to realize is the first character we're taking is going to be the highest order digit, right? So if we're looking at converting 123, the first time we iterate is going to be 1, but we need that to be 100 by the end, right? So one thing you can do is that with every subsequent digit you take, you multiply your value by 10, so that by the time you reach the end, everything has been shifted upwards, right? So the first time you run it, you have 1 as your value. Second time you run it, you multiply your value by 10, it will you know, update it so that it's now 10 and you add on your next value. And then you multiply that by 10 and add on your next value. And this is why I, th I say it's, this is much more of like testing a math algorithm versus CS, but I digress. I don't write the quizzes. So one thing we can do is we say value times equals 10. So this is going to shift your digit once every time. And then we do, we just want to add, we want to add in what we just got, right? So how do we actually convert our ASCII character into the number that it represents? <coughs> so we know that 0 is equal to 47, right? So if 0 is 47, what would we have to do to it to actually make it be an int of 0? What is 48? 48, sorry. We would subtract 48, right? So if we take, remember ASCII math, you can treat them just like normal numbers. If you treat them like numbers, they become numbers effectively. So if we have s of i, which let's say in this case is equal to 0, so s of i, in this case, would be the ASCII, the ASCII int for it would be 47. So we could subtract, or sorry, 48. We could do that is one way. Does anyone know a better way we could do 48? We just said 0 is the ASCII. We could do close to. Does, does it kind of make sense how this works? Mm -hmm. so at this point, um, is the value zero because you're mul even if you multiply it by ten, you're starting out with zero. So should right. it be switched? Um, so in this case, you wanna you wanna multiply it before you add um, because in this case, yes, it would still be your value. Right, my pointer is missing. Uh, the value in this case, the first time we run it, will be zero. Um, so you're just adding on that first digit. What's important is the next time you iterate, you want to shift it up 
before you add your next digit on. Does that clarify for you? Okay, so yeah. Sometimes you're gonna get weird, more mathy things. Um, if you had like most of this, you're still gonna get like, you're gonna do pretty well. Partial credit is a very big thing on CSP quizzes, so write what you know. If you got everything except for like here, like you're still gonna do really well on the problem because you're showing like, okay, I almost know, I know that I need to iterate through, I know what I need to check for, I just don't quite get how to like convert it. You're gonna be okay. Yes, you're gonna lose a couple points, but you're still gonna get a good number of points for something like that if you're missing these two lines. I would be like, okay, this person knows what they're doing. They just, you know, math is hard. So I would say you'd be fine. Okay, so you guys ready to try Sterling with pointers? Now that you guys are pointer masters. So I'll let you guys work on that for a little bit. <clears throat> if anyone needs a refresher. Do you wanna use pointer or arithmetic? And then if S is null, your implementation should return zero. Things like this that make you really happy to just call Sterling at the end of the day. I think this one might be a little easier than the last one we just did. Give you guys another minute and then we'll work through it. And then we get to go to switches. Ready guys? Maybe a little bit? So, I've given you your two options, right? Either check for null, and return zero if it is, or actually compute the length. So, who wants to write check for null? Go for it. Um, if parentheses s equals equals null, return zero. Lovely. I love when like half your problem is just like checking for null. I know if you guys last week I was like check for null literally every time. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. 
Return zero is like only one line. Do we still need the curly brackets? You don't technically need them. Um, but it's as long as you're good consistent, practice. it's good practice. Okay. Um, just to get in the habit of using curly braces, but technically, no, you don't need them for one line. We just tend to recommend it for people starting to program. Okay. So now, what we what might we want to do here? So now we know that our string is valid. We want to compute the length. What's probably the first thing we want to do? Um, create an int that's the length. Exactly. And we want to set it to? Zero. Zero. Perfect. All right. Now what do we want to do? This is really the bulk of it. Go for it. Um, so you probably do a for loop. Um, and then so since when you call s, you're getting the address of the first, mm -hmm. um, then you would start with i equals zero. Um, and then as long as s plus i isn't um, like backslash the null zero, terminator. the null terminator, mm -hmm. um, then you add one to length. Yeah, OK. So let's turn that into, into very concrete yeah. code. But that is the perfect idea. That's exactly what we're doing. We're going to be iterating through with the pointer, OK? So what we want to do is instead of an int here, because we're not referring to an int, we're referring to the start of a string, that start being some address, right? So we want a pointer. So we're going to have some char star because it corresponds to our s, right? So this is some pointer we're initializing to the start of the string, OK? So let's just call it i. If it's the start of the string, what's it going to be assigned to? Not 0. We want it to be the start of our string. What represents the start of our string that was given to us? Just s. 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 OK. So this creates some new pointer that represents the start of our string. OK? If you guys, another way to think of it is like, here's our array. That's our string. S. So let's say this is the first spot. And this is 0, x, 4, 0, 4. Um, this is our s, which holds that address. And we just created another one called i that just refers to the same thing. So they're both just pointing to the start of our string. That's just a graphic representation. OK. <clears throat> so now, um, what we want to do is we want to iterate our condition for, reiterate, for iterating through our string. No, shopping. Got to shop, guys. Um, is we want to keep updating until we reach the null terminator, right? So what might that look like? Do we want i or do we want star i is the question. Is the null terminator an address or something located at an address? Located at an address, right? So we need to dereference whatever's here. Because this is just some address. To actually get to the start, oh my god, we need to dereference this so that we actually get what's in this first place. Right? So if we do star i, what don't we want it to equal? Backslash. There. Does that make sense to everyone? We need to go into our string and make sure that it's not the end. And then we can just update like this. Normal updating. So as long as these are met, what do we need to do? Link uh, plus. Mm -hmm. And then after the for loop terminates, what do we want to return? Link plus. There you go. Obviously, the meat of this one is understanding this for loop. Does everyone get how that worked? I'm happy to go over it again. But the second part, mm -hmm. so the star i there, mm -hmm. that's the address of the first. It's not the address. It's what's at. That's actually in the That's what's place. actually in there. So remember, so this is saying, um, let me make this better. So this is 0, x, 0, 4. And I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to make this my name. So 
Okay. Yes, I know I have quiz review tonight. <laughs> Lots of quiz review. Um, so let's say this string is my name, right? Allison. A little messy, but it's there. And S represents the location of where this string starts. So I'm going to make this real. There. This is the address of A, where the string starts, right? So what we do here is we want to use pointers to iterate through. So we create some pointer, i, that also is equal to the start of this string. And at each point, we want to continue going through the array here until we hit the null terminator. So we always want to check what's at each of these addresses. So we dereference i so that we, the first time we do it, we say, OK, what's at address 0, x04? It's an a. OK, we're good. Increment length. Move on to the next one. So i, remember pointers increase by the size um, of whatever's, whatever they're pointing to. So in this case, since it's a char, it'll update by 1. So now we're going to look at 5, which means it's pointing over here. So it says, OK, go to 0x05. What's in there? It's an L. And it'll keep doing that until it hits this one. And it says, OK, what's in whatever address this is? The null terminator? OK, exit and just return length. Because you need what's actually at that address, not the address itself. <clears throat> there are very few places where you actually need the address. Most of the time when you're using the and, it's when you are first assigning a pointer um, or when you're passing it into another function. OK. Is everyone good there? Kind of? OK. So it looks like we've got about 12 minutes left. So we'll go on to maybe our last problem. And then if there's any concepts that have come up in the meantime, we can quickly go over that. So switching gears is the last problem here. Switch statement. So your job is to rewrite this so that it behaves the same but doesn't use switches. So any questions about this off the bat? None? OK. Does everyone understand that if the case doesn't have anything after it, it means that it should follow the next step? So case 1 and 2 in this case do the exact same thing? Sometimes a point of confusion. Anyone have any ideas? Um, yeah. So you can just do like if statements. Mm -hmm. So what's our first one? Um, like if n equals equals 1, and then the two lines for or, mm -hmm. n equals equals 2, then print small. And then can you do else if, or do mm -hmm. can you just do an if? You can do else if. Um, Would it matter if you do if? So it does. Does anyone? So you will get the same output if you use just ifs versus if you use else ifs. 
Can you guys think of a reason why you might want to use an else if versus a lot of ifs? <coughs> Has to do with efficiency. Yeah. It would check all the ifs mm -hmm. every time. If, yeah. So even if it hit this first one, it would go on to check every other one. So you want to use if else ifs in cases where only one of them will ever apply. So mutual exclusion is what we tend to say. If you, if you have a bunch of ifs, it means that maybe more than one of them matters. And maybe more than one of them can be true. And you want both of them to execute if they're true. If you only want one of them to work in these mutual exclusive, mutually exclusive cases, you want to use else if. Because it all has to do with like efficiency. Your code is just better designed if it kind of adheres to this practice. So in this case, we'll have an else if. So would this one be? N equals equals three. three. Perfect. Print <coughs> slash medium. And then in our last case, would we have else or else if? Else. Do we I'll want do you want else if? Because we have concrete cases. It's not kind of a catch-all. If you had a default in a switch, remember in switches you can have case and then you have default. If you had a default, that's kind of your else statement there. But if it has only cases, that means you need to check to see if it's each of those. So in this case, it would be four, four, five. We want to print our large. And there you go. And that would be your program. So in this case, if we had a default something, we would have an else and whatever it wanted us to do. So that is a good distinction to, to know and to understand. Does that help with switches for you? Perfect. All right. Any, we have about eight minutes left. Do you guys have any other? High level concepts, questions in general. Yes. I had a question about um, <clears throat> one of them that was about the random number generator on Oh, zero. that one. That one is another one where it is There's like the map more map than yeah. yes. Um, the solution to that, even I like when I see it, I'm like, what is this? Uh, it's number seven. It's it's strange in my opinion. So basically, you want to use DRAND48, which uses, um, it will give you some number between 0 and 1. And you want to use it so that you somehow get a And it's much more of a math problem to me than I think a CS problem. Um, the way that you do it. And sometimes it will just be like that. Um, again, these are the cases where it's kind of like, write what you can and partial credit. <laughs> so if we want to return, we know that we're going to be using DRAND48 in some way, right? So why don't we just jot that down? We're using it in some way. The way that they have you guys use it is like this which I will try and explain. So basically what happens here is because it's between 0 and 1, what you're doing is you're multiplying by, this is very much a math question. Like just full disclaimer, this is completely a math question. What you're doing is because it's 0 and 1 and you want it to be within this range, you actually figure out how large the range is and then you basically scale it up, which is what this is doing. B minus A gives you like that range um, the difference between those numbers that you can multiply between 0 and 1. Um, and then adding A just means that you're scaling it up so that it's between A and B. Which I didn't really like this problem. <laughs> but it's kind of, as I said, this, this quiz is meant to encompass people who are less comfortable somewhere in between and more comfortable. So if they made it so that it was something that everyone at the less comfortable place would get, we would have far too many people scoring perfects. 
and the more comfortable would be bored. Um, so they always have these kind of brain teaser questions um, that are meant to be a little harder, that take you know, some creative thinking. Um, so don't, when you see them, like, don't get too stumped. I would definitely say flip through your quiz first, tackle the problems that you know you can, um, because there's no use getting stuck on a problem when there are like three or four or five on the page after that you can easily do. Um, so yeah. Why do you multiply it by the range? You multiply it by the range that you know, like, it's like how much after A do you want? Like, so it's, you can think of, um, because it returns a number between zero and one, you can think of it as a percentage. So it's basically saying like, if we have our number line here, and A's here, and B's here, you're like, how much past A is it, is all we're doing. So by, you're just asking for like the percentage of this range, which is what it's giving you. And then you basically just scale it up by adding A. It's a math brain teaser. Um, but yeah, if there was any like last minute advice, I would say flip through the questions, figure out which ones you know that like, oh, I got this. Almost surely there are gonna be questions that you won't know or that you're gonna run out of time for. So hit your strengths, okay? You guys are gonna do great. There are a lot of questions for a reason so that you have time to kind of you have the opportunity to demonstrate what you're really good at. So it's okay if you're not good at everything. Play to your strengths. Yes? Um, so is this gonna return something that's truncated? Um, it, yes, well, because uh, DRAN returns between zero and one, but yeah, it'll return an int because it'll truncate when we um, add A or multiply by it. Cool. Any last minute questions? You guys are going to do great. You're going to be fabulous. And even if not, there will be candy here next week. So, and I'll love you. I'll love you guys regardless. All right, everyone, good luck. Have a great time. You're going to be fine. And you know what? In two days, it's going to be over. So, whereas I have two midterms on Thursday. So, at least you guys will be done. All right, I'll see you guys next week.